I'm Pardis. I'm really excited to present to you guys. Um, and I've, I've done RSI this summer presentation year after year, and it's always like a great highlight. Um, and I've taken RSI students in my lab. Andrew Jin in my lab went on to win the Intel Prize. Um, you guys are, uh, all of you, no matter what you do, um, are in such an amazing place in your careers. And I'm really just mostly excited to get a chance to interact with you. And so in this presentation, I'm just going to, um, particularly since uh, the students in this program are from all different, uh, doing different kinds of fields, uh, rather than get into very specific details of any particular experiment, I'm going to give you an overview of how my lab thinks about the work that we do. And, and that's in the, in the realm of um, how to respond to outbreaks, infectious disease outbreaks around the world, these pandemics that we con are concerned about, and how can we, in the genomic age, in the information age, uh, have an impact. And so this is like a, we'll have more pictures than a lot of the talks you may have seen, um, but I hopefully it'll stimulate thought and uh, conversation. And so, I, you know, to start out, I, I'm going to just kind of set the stage talking about the um, uh, 2014 Ebola outbreak uh, in West Africa. That most of you, is anyone in this room not heard about the Ebola outbreak of 2014? Okay. All right. So um, I think that's one of the things that captured everybody's attention. Um, and, uh, and so you may know a lot of this story, but you may not know every detail. Um, and the reason why my lab had, uh, knows a very specific uh, a number of these details is because we work um, in Sierra Leone at the Kenema Government Hospital, pictured here. And when the Ebola outbreak uh, was first declared in Guinea um, in March of 2014, members of my lab uh, went to our site in Sierra Leone, helped them establish diagnostics for Ebola. We'd already been doing it for some time for another virus called Lassa virus that circulates in the region. We recognized if Ebola came into the country, we would have to uh, see it. Um, and we made sure that we did that both in Sierra Leone and in Nigeria where we worked um, because we you know, uh, were concerned that this uh, outbreak would escalate. And if you recall, um, if you sort of paying closer attention, you may have heard that um, even though the outbreak was declared in March of 2014, um, uh, where there are already 60 cases in Guinea, that when they tried to trace back and find out where did it come from, uh, they believe, and this is all retrospective epidemiology, so it's just you know, from storytelling what they piece together, that it likely happened um, when a, a young boy, an 18-month-old boy named Emil, was playing in a tree dis that was disturbed, uh, that had bats in it, um, and suddenly fell ill. And then soon after, uh, his loved ones fell ill, then other individuals in the village fell ill, and by the time the outbreak was declared, it had already spread through multiple districts, like in a wide region of Guinea. And then by April, it had spread into Liberia and even a, a larger geographical space. But in May, when it finally came into Sierra Leone, it really exploded. So the cases just suddenly exploded out of control until it was essentially in every district in the region. Uh, or being you know, identified in every district, nearly every district in the region. And if you look at it from another vantage point of the cases, you can see that already in April and you know, uh, in May, uh, there were hundreds of cases. It was already one of the largest Ebola outbreaks that had ever been surveyed. Um, but it was nothing like when it came into Sierra Leone in late May um, and then exploded in June. Uh, and the trajectory changed. There was an, this inflection point um, where the, the international community became overwhelmed. And part of that was likely that, you know, we'd, we weren't prepared for such a large outbreak of Ebola. MSF and the WHO had already used all of the resources it usually puts for emergencies, and so wasn't ready to go into Sierra Leone. Um, and Sierra Leone has a large population and a lot of metropolitan areas. So there's a number of reasons why it would have exploded like this, but you know, there's questions of are there other reasons? And some of that information could possibly be hidden in genomic data. So one of the um, things that we did while we were there is not only did we uh, help establish diagnostics, but my lab uh, is a lab that has done sequencing of viruses for some time, and we were working in Kenema to establish to, and sequence um, Lassa fire, the Lassa virus, another hemorrhagic fever virus, uh, in that region. And when uh, Ebola came into the country, we immediately shipped samples to the Broad Institute here. Um, and began to sequence them and identified, indeed, there was Ebola uh, in this region, looked at first 14 cases, and then within a couple of weeks, we had 99 uh, samples from uh, patients that we were sequencing. We generated this data, and what we saw was the virus is mutating. You know, hundreds of mutations uh, were appearing in the genome of the virus. So this is not unexpected. 
this is what viruses do, particularly RNA viruses. Uh, the thing is, though, sometimes it just takes data to, uh, you know, recognize that urgency, that, that volatility of the situation, and a lot of data. We had a lot of data. And using this data, we could already begin to analyze the, the genomes and create what we call phylogenetic trees or family trees to understand the relationships between the different viral species. And one of the most striking initial things that we saw was that this, all of these cases were very, very closely related and closely related to the cases in Guinea as well. It suggested that the virus had entered the human population once and from there was transmitting to hum from human to human. Now that's very different from what the international community was thinking at the beginning of the outbreak. When the outbreak started, they were concerned that it was coming in from the environment, from monkeys, from bats, from fruit that had been touched by these animals. And so all of the messaging was really pushing people to stay away from all of these things. And for a lot of communities, that was their main source of, you know, food. Um, the mangoes uh, in the region, they were, they were basically being told to ward off uh, a lot of the foods that they need to be able to fight infections. Um, and so once we identified that this is really human to human transmission, the messaging shifted. Uh, and there was much more attention to hand washing and uh, staying away, you know, keeping a distance um, uh, from each other, uh, contact tracing, the importance of that, because this was really a moving through human populations. But it also allowed us to start interrogating those mutations that emerged. Now, the vast majority of mutations that happen in a virus's genome or in any genome have no effect. They're just sort of, you know, happening within regions that might not be biologically meaningful, or they may not change the, the biology of that. Uh, region, or a lot of them are actually just deleterious and they get cleared out. But if you have enough opportunities for changes to occur, every once in a while something might happen that we may pay attention to. And so what we found by looking at these genomes is suddenly right when that inflection point happened, when the outbreak changed in its course, an alanine to valine mutation showed up in Ebola's glycoprotein. Now that's a surface protein that coats the virus that allows it to bind human cells and enter. And right where that binding partner is on the human side, there's mutations in humans and non-human primates that make it distinct from other mammals like bats uh, or, you know, uh, monkey, uh, sorry, not like lower, lower primates, um, other, uh, any other mammal in the region that might be a reservoir, might be something it's contacting to, it was different. And so when we actually started investigating further, what we saw is this very particular mutation increased the infectivity of the virus and it did so in a way that was human and non-human primate specific. So it made it better able to infect human cells and non-human primate cells and less able to infect bat cells and other mammalian cells. And so the implications of this are pretty profound um, that Ebola, when given more opportunities to transmit from human to human than it had ever done before in our you know, knowledge, had improved in its ability to do so. And that's sort of you know, one reason, potentially, why, by the time this outbreak ended, there were already 30,000 confirmed cases, over 11,000 deaths. This was a scale we had never seen before. And we're, you know, we're seeing something like this again, still not quite at this level. And, you know, it was, a, it was an immense tragedy. Um, but the greatest tragedy of it is that this was a, um, a disease that mostly affected uh, those who care. Healthcare workers were disproportionately affected, including Dr. Khan, who was the head of the ward at the uh, Kent. Last award at Kenema, uh, many hundreds of um, healthcare workers across West Africa, including uh, hundreds even uh, in Sierra Leone and in Kenema itself. Um, and so we, we lost a, a tremendous amount. It was a massive tragedy, but we actually avoided a cataclysm. So this is actually Christian Happy, my other um, uh, longtime partner, who is at the Redeemer's University in Nigeria. This is us sitting at Redemption Church, which is about 100 years old. 100 yards away from where Christian's lab is. So Christian's lab is on the grounds of Redemption Church. It's Redeemer's University. And this is where he called me at, you know, uh, early in the morning uh, to tell me that he had just, you know, finished after working all night long in the lab and identified the first case of Ebola in Nigeria, a city of 20 million, in Lagos, Nigeria, a city of 20 million. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, on the grounds of where we were sitting, 100 yards away from his lab, this is what the scene looked like just a week later. This is um, at Redemption Church. The church at this point seated 1 million people. Um, by now it seats 3 million people. And this was the annual uh, first Friday in which uh, tens of millions of individuals come from throughout West Africa to visit here. And so Christian and I always talk about this 
you know, that day and that day that he had to leave because they were bringing in the lambs for the slaughter, they were bringing in the tanks to protect from Boko Haram, they were preparing for this massive number of people and he was having to prepare to get off of the grounds for this massive event, is what could have happened if Ebola moved through this group of people, um, the kind of tragedy, tragedy that could occur. And so fundamentally, we're always concerned about that possibility that one day uh, another outbreak will strike, it'll strike in a major city, uh, uh, possibly one without very good you know, infrastructure like Calcutta or even Lagos, um, and not be controlled, and what would that mean? And so if we want to think about what to do, uh, this is how my lab perceives it. So the first thing you need to do is be able to detect uh, these viruses, these pathogens, as they emerge anywhere, in any location, at any scale, uh, as best as we can with the technologies available. Then we need to be able to connect that information in real time, share it so that we can see where cases start to emerge and what kind of patterns exist. Then we need to make sure that in that system that we create, no matter how good it is, if people don't participate, don't engage into the system, that, then we won't be able to do what we need to do. So how do we get individuals to come to attention and to uh, want to be diagnosed and detected? And then empower every actor in that system to be as informed as possible, to be able to respond as well as possible. And then finally, to all of that is to buy time in order to overcome the event. So just walking you through each of those different things and what my lab does to think about them for detection. Um, this is the team that did the sequencing of Ebola virus during the Ebola outbreak. Um, you know, it was a really big team that had been working together for a long time, that had deep relationships. So we were able to work very, very quickly when the, um, when the outbreak was declared and everybody moved uh, rapidly to begin uh, doing the sequencing. Um, and this is at the Broad Institute's uh, uh, sort of factory that's on Binney Street that houses a, a warehouse for these sequencing machines. So this is the kind of thing that, you know, at the time could really only happen in a place like this that had these kinds of resources. Um, and the fact, the reason that we could sequence it so quickly um, uh, is that we um, didn't have a technology that had to be developed directly for Ebola. Uh, what we've been developing for LASA worked fine for Ebola. It was a technology that allows you to take any sample and just read out all of the genome sequence in that sample, whatever it is, in a, in a completely unbiased way, using these sophisticated machines. But you know, you don't, the one, we always talk about, we wanted a chart to show the time it took to do the sequencing, and the vast majority of the time it took was to get IRB approval to send it out of the country and you know, get that shipment to happen. That is the long lag. We don't want that kind of a lag. You know, it took, in, the, in the first instance, it took a weeks, but once the international community came in and everybody started acting out and competing with each other, it took months to get the next shipment out. I mean, that, that is the kind of chaos that can happen, so we really need those technologies on the ground. So one of the things we've been doing is we partnered with Mass Design Firm, which is an extraordinary architecture firm here in Boston, uh, sort of world-renowned uh, architecture firm that has designed and is now uh, almost completed uh, this structure, which is a genome center designed to work in Nigeria uh, with you know, all of the issues in working in Nigeria, like power, uh, you know, excessive heat, um, uh, you know, this is designed with condensed soil to sort of work perfectly in a cooling environment uh, that you need for a genome center. The one thing is, though, um, you know, you need that kind of very sophisticated lab if you're trying to do massively parallel sequencing in this kind of way. But for the vast majority of things, you don't necessarily need that because for most viruses that we're concerned about that might become the next big epidemic, you know, most of the time we've seen them before. So Zika was a very big epidemic in 2015, but we had known about it since 1947. And Ebola we had known about since 1976. There's a large set of viruses that are high-risk viruses that we've known about for decades. Um, and so we don't need to wait uh, for an epidemic to be able to build the technologies to pick these up wherever they happen at any scale. And so in the middle of the Ebola outbreak, all we did was we had designed PCR assays that target the Ebola virus um, from what we'd seen circulating um, and uh, generated, you know, used it to generate uh, many, many copies of that sequence and run it out on a gel, um, doing a PCR, PCR, run it out on a gel, and this is actually the gel that shows the first case of Ebola in Sierra Leone, um, and it was as simple as that. But the thing about PCR is it still needs electricity and it still needs somebody who's like a very informed operator, and so it can only happen within uh, sort of hospitals or research labs. We need something that could happen in villages right at that point, right when, uh, you know, in that, when that 18-month-old boy became sick, how, why didn't we know immediately what he had? 
And so what we want is a diagnostic that could work in the field, and ideally something that could be rapidly programmed. And nucleic acids are very good at being rapidly programmed, because if you can just, just get something to target a sequence and then read it out, you can essentially you know, put in, uh, type in, and, and identify anything as, you identify, as, you, as it emerges. And one of the really great technologies for this is CRISPR. So you may well have heard about CRISPR because it's revolutionizing molecular biology and human health. But fundamentally, the CRISPR system was first identified in nature as the bacteria's immune system to viruses. So it, it is designed to detect and, uh, you know, a, and interact with viruses. And so essentially, bacteria have um, a version of a, um, a guide. And I, in fact, sorry, this one's a little bit uh, not quite right. There's, there's some extra loops there. I, this is, um, uh, but essentially, they ha it has a guide sequence that will go and it'll identify a particular sequence of, in this case, a virus sequence. And if it does, then it pulls in a protein that acts as a nuclease that will cut um, uh, at, what, at whatever region it identifies. And there's a particular kind of Cas protein called Cas13 that will, um, does something unusual. So when it cuts, it doesn't just cut the sequence it wants to cut. It then immediately starts cutting sort of promiscuously. It cuts everything in the region. And we can use that in a very interesting way. If we actually uh, pair that with a fluorescent readout that's quenched, that has a quencher on it, if that quencher gets cut, cut off from the fluorescent pulp, it'll light up. And so what you can do is actually you can create something that identifies a virus sequence, cuts it, and then when it cuts it, it causes the fluorescence to happen. That makes a perfect diagnostic, and a perfect diagnostic that can be moved to a paper-based diagnostic that can be done completely from, uh, in a non-invasive way. You can take a urine sample or a saliva sample, and you can, without doing any extractions, you can go all the way through a, a process to get a readout on paper to say, do you have or do you not have a virus? Um, so those are the kinds of technologies that we're creating at each of these levels and, and working towards to build from national genome centers to regional hospitals to village clinics. We want to be able to detect viruses at any scale. But then we need to connect that information. So it's great if those different sites are identifying that, but we need to be able to then put that all together, put the pieces together, and, and, and say, how is this thing spreading? And what's fascinating was that during the Ebola outbreak, and this was the first outbreak I was involved in just because it really came to where I was working, um, we started to see that it's not like what you see on television. There's not these fancy computers and things like that. Things are being passed around on paper, by a guy, on a moped, maybe by uh, a Word doc not even usually an Excel spreadsheet to tell you all the cases that were emerging and where they were happening. Um, and so the technologies just weren't really good to share information in real time. And this is not just, you know, in a place like West Africa. This is the kinds of, the uh, same thing was happening during swine flu, you know, when, when members of my group went to Cleveland. This is, everybody just looking at paper readouts. It was all very, very um, old school in the way we're doing it. But what you really need to be able to do is take all of these different sites that are collecting information and share information in real time. And so we've developed cloud-based systems that activate, that take in this information and share it on a dashboard. And we've, we've created a network of groups uh, within Nigeria, including our Redeemers University there in the center, and then other hospitals that have more advanced diagnostics, and then these rapid diagnostic tests that we're placing in, uh, you know, uh, around the country. Uh, and we're also work partnered. We've now established uh, sequencers in Nigeria and in Senegal and Sierra Leone. And we've worked with USAMR to, to set them up in Liberia and have been uh, training individuals to work in those regions. Um, and that's just the start of it. So let's say we actually do this and we create these systems to do this detection. We create uh, a network of sites that are uh, detecting this. Then how do we get people to engage? How do we get people to come? I mean, you all would imagine that you know, in high school, uh, you live with your parents still, most of you. Um, and so your parents might drag you to the hospital. Once you get to college, you'll realize that you'll be like fulminantly, uh, you know, septic, and you still will be like, I'm not going to make it to UHS. Like, I don't want to leave my dorm room. And so, how do we get people to say, I'm somebody, I am sick. Uh, let, let me go get tested. Um, and so, uh, one of the places that we had an insight about this is at Harvard University, where I serve uh, as a member of the committee that manages outbreaks. And so, we, you know, we're in panel during the Ebola outbreak, but we're also in panels for even smaller things. And so. You know, at one point, we had to get on a conference call because we started identifying a number of cases of paratitis that were happening on sports teams, on hockey teams, and football teams, and soccer teams. Um, and uh, eventually, individuals were detected to have mumps and 
we started to see that spreading through the sports campus. And then soon after, kind of entering into the college life. Um, and we then saw it in the freshman dining hall because staff and faculty who were, you know, who would eat there or work there were becoming infected. Then it showed up in university health services where nurses became infected. Then at commencement that happened later, uh, several staff became infected and then went off and seeded an outbreak in the local community in which they live. And so we were able to see kind of in this real time way how this outbreak was moving through this campus. Um, and because Harvard is so concerned about being in the New York Times, it's amazing at risk management. It, it, it started, it, it's um, public health operations are fantastic in that way. They, they were tracking all of this, but they're still doing it by hand, by calling, by you know, contacting and reaching out to people. When we started analyzing the genomic data that came from these samples, we took these samples and we sequenced them, we could start to see all these patterns and how these individuals were related. And we started to realize that if we could actually get you know, this epi data as, as good as possible and the sequence data at the same time, we could connect all the dots and see how transmissions were occurring in real time. And really, Boston is, an amazing place to do this work and an amazing place to breed outbreaks. Because if you think about it, there are 60 residential colleges right in the Boston area, 110 institutions of higher learning. There are students everywhere living together, eating together, playing beer pong together, doing all sorts of things that would allow for viruses to move through populations. And this is just a schematic because I, uh, for HIPAA reasons, don't want to show you, you know, privacy reasons, don't want to show you exactly what's going on here. But a number of the universities, including Harvard, have, um, in the paper that we're writing about it, have, uh, have opened uh, their names so that we can actually start to talk about how these things are, are moving through population. And so, in a way, Boston is not only, you know, an epicenter of where outbreaks can occur, but a really amazing laboratory by which to understand outbreaks and how they move and to work together to build a system. If we could create a system um, that allows us to respond to outbreaks within college campuses, it's the kind of thing we could scale more broadly. And the way that Facebook had to start within a closed system in which there are, you know, individuals that were all engaging. You couldn't have a Facebook where, like, two people put their information on the web. You needed a lot of people to do it so that more people had a reason to come to it, right? And so in order to get people to engage, to, to say if they're sick, they need to know who else is sick. They need to know information that we might get from those people. So nowhere in medicine do we use information enough and data enough, but particularly in infectious disease where the information of your social network gives you information about what you have. That's a really powerful tool. And so we created an app, and this is just a prototype of it, that allows you to say, okay, I'm not feeling so well, and I you know, come to class, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm in these, this set of classes, and, and I have these symptoms, and you pop it in, and then suddenly it says, oh, you know, based on the symptoms that you're saying, you could have this, this, and this. These are things that are circulating in the region. Oh, but you know, seven people in your intro to genetics class are also displaying the same symptoms. Oh, and two of them came down with mumps you may have mumps, right? So in the mumps example, you might have quickly been like, oh yeah, you, you know, I'm swollen glands here, I'm on the football team, three other people on the football team. But you never know, right? You're always sitting there suspecting your friend and you think, you know, did you get me sick? And what do you have? And you're, you know, but nobody really asks and everyone kind of blames. Uh, but it shouldn't be a blame game. It should be, a, it should be basically an investigation that we do together to help each other get answers. And so you know, that's how we want to engage in a number of ways of getting people to get the information they need so that they want to share information with you. Um, the next thing is to empower. Uh, you know, so ways that we're thinking about that is through education is a, is a critical one. This is the lobby of the Broad Institute, uh, where this is one of several classes uh, of a program that we have. It's a seven-week summer program where, where students come, have come from six different countries around the world uh, and done trainings in molecular biology and bioinformatics and advanced sequencing, uh, a number of different courses that we lead, also in project management but really trying to you know, uh, develop this next generation of leaders around the world who can do this work on the front lines. But we also want to uh, engage students, engage anyone in the public, really, to think about an outbreak, right? You don't have to be a researcher to think about outbreaks. It affects everybody. So this is the Sarasota, Mid this is the Sarasota Military Prep Academy in Sarasota, Florida. Anybody here from Florida? Awesome. Okay, I'm from Florida. I'm from Orlando. Um, and, uh, and so this is, um, and basically uh, there's a teacher named Todd Brown, Major Todd Brown, who works there, who I'd been connected to for some time, who had the idea to do an outbreak simulation, and, and I helped sort of advise him as he developed this really quite fascinating um, simulation where he had an ep epi teams and clinical teams all trying to figure out what was going on in the outbreak. And in the early instances of it, uh, you know, you could see that people would get stickers, stickers that would tell them they're infected. That was always like a little bit of a challenge because 
at the end of the day, we had stickers, we had lollipops. How do we spread this virus? How do we make this game really work? Um, but then ultimately, we had an idea um, in, in one of our meetings that, like, that phones would be a perfect way of spreading it through Bluetooth. And so we created an app that spreads a virus on your phone via Bluetooth. We created a model that allows you to create an outbreak simulation with the right parameters to work within small populations, because this was, this was 200 students doing this. Um, and so we had to create a, uh, something that was a realistic outbreak that happened with a small set of individuals and set different parameters. It allows you to set different parameters. The students always want to make it more deadly. We try to make it more realistic. Um, but, you know, and we, we play out this entire game um, uh, together, and it's quite fascinating. That in, you, not only do they learn a lot about outbreaks, they learn a lot about how to, you know, how viruses work, how um, epi works. They had, we had a government team that had to think about vaccines, but we also got to see how things break down. I mean, it almost seemed laughable at first when, you know, we found out that, uh, you know, one of the military had shot one of the other students, um, and it seemed crazy, but at, this, at the same time, the student was, didn't want, you know, was, was very suspicious, didn't want to show their status. They were being forced to show their status. They kind of came charging at the military. The military didn't know what to do and, and felt like he had nothing to do but to shoot the person. And, uh, and these are the kinds of things that happen. Or, you know, later, basically, uh, the way that at that point you were showing your status is by uh, flashing the screen to say what you're, you know, you're, uh, what, if you're sick or you're not sick. And what people had done is taken a picture of the asymptomatic and kept it on their screen and were showing it. So then they had to, it was this, this cat and mouse game where people kept trying to get out of the system and then we had to figure out new ways of, tra the students had to figure out new ways of tracking them down, forcing them to like shift and show the app and it's working. Uh, also, the government team decided at one point that they had a limited amount of money for vaccines. They made sure they got vaccines first. People <laughs> found out about that. So all sorts of breakdowns, but these are the natural things that happen and it's a great environment. Rather than find that out when you're punching somebody in a supermarket for you know, scraps, why not find it out in a, in a healthy way? You don't want the first time you have to think about the implications of an outbreak to happen in the middle of an actual devastating event. Um, and then finally, the last part is to overcome. And so through overcoming, the one thing we, we talk about and why we're so passionate about genomics is genomes are so cool. They essentially, they themselves are a blueprint that you can use to track and detect things, but then they also code everything that's important, right? So they code, the genome codes for the proteins on the surface that are uh, targeted by antibodies. And, that we use within our vaccines. They basically create, as they change, all of those things need to change in real time. And so you know, we can inform by constantly monitoring how the virus is changing, we can help improve all of these different uh, things. But also, um, what we need is something faster. If it, um, when the 1918 Spanish flu hit, it is estimated to have killed 25 million people in 25 weeks and gone on to uh, you know, cause the deaths of 50 to 100 million people. Imagine 25 million people in 25 weeks. We don't have months, the six months it takes right now to create a new vaccine for uh, flu, in our seasonal flu vaccine. We have days. How do we create a uh, therapy that could work within days? Well, it'd have to be something where you could program it very, very quickly. And if you could create something that targets the sequence itself, you could create the platform by which you could then just plug in whatever the sequences you want to target and then go after that. And we, for that, we, you know, we uh, as a group have come back to thinking about CRISPR. Again, CRISPR was originally designed and identified in nature um, because it is the bacteria's immune system to viruses. It's what circulates, looks for viruses, and cu cuts them down. And so if we can harness that power and figure out how to move that system into mammalian cells, we could have a potent uh, programmable antiviral. And that's a, a big part of what my lab now does. Um, to really, and we, we're really aiming to get down to that four-day limit. So fundamentally, that is, you know, a, a wide array of projects, but they all kind of come together with this basic idea that if you're going to respond to outbreaks, we need to be able to detect them rapidly and anywhere, connect that information in real time, you know, across the world, engage every individual to want to participate, to come to attention, to know that they'll be supported and, and helped and to empower each individual so they're informed, so we're ready to go, so we're not surprised by anything, uh, while we all work to overcome. And so that's a lot of what my lab does. My lab does a num number of other projects, but that, that is fundamentally one of the kind of prime drivers of my lab's work. Um, and and uh, I sort of um, talk about you know, the science that we do, but it's also really important that my lab is very, very much focused on creating communities, creating families. One of the reasons that we were able to respond so quickly during the Ebola outbreak was that 
you know, we were a family. We had just come back from a retreat where we were all sleeping on top of each other and playing, uh, doing um, uh, like ropes course types of activities and we were very, very bonded. And so when the first you know, samples came in, when the first cases were heard, the teams just orchestrated themselves. So that sort of teamwork is so important. And here I am in, um, uh, uh, in uh, Nigeria in our hospital, the Aru Specialist Te Teaching Hospital there. And I, I often, when I tell this story, I talk about the fact that you know, one of the great things that, that um, I began to do when I first arrived in Nigeria for the first time was sing with the women who worked there. So I was a singer. I'd brought in a guitar because I had to perform right after and wanted to make sure I was practicing. So I'd sometimes practice after work. And we all would start to, to kind of come together and sing. They have this tradition. Everybody at this lab uh, starts every day, every morning by getting together and singing. And it's so important and fundamental to creating that community and creating that bond. And ultimately, wars are, um, there are many different kinds of wars, but um, outbreaks are a war that really can only be won by cooperation. It's, it's sort of a test of humanity against an outside threat. And so in that context, um, I think I have, um, yeah, I have a, a clip that, I may or, that may or may not go. Let's see. I wonder if this will go. Sorry. I did not test this before. In a moment, if you want, after maybe I'll do the questions, but uh, I, I realized I didn't connect the video. So like I didn't check to see if it's connected and always falls off if I'm not sure. Um, I can show you part of the video if you want. But anyway, this is a video that we, uh, I'm a musician. Uh, Philomena, who's here actually doing a master's program now at Harvard with me, um, is, uh, is a musician. And we write music together. And this is a song that we'd written during the Ebola outbreak uh, about the, the work that we do, uh, about sort of what was going on for us in the midst of the outbreak. Um, I will come back to that if you want. Um, anyway, the, so that's sort of that's the gist of the how I think about science, how I think about uh, outbreak response. Um, these are the folks that make it possible. This is so um, my lab every year puts together an annual holiday card. Uh, these are the folks that were in the lab over years and years. This is one of our early cards where we actually shot the whole thing underwater um, and, uh, and put together this card. That's a picture to show you the kind of original shots that we took it from. We actually got like all, all of us got into a, a pool together and did these amazing photos underwater of our underwater laboratory. Uh, this is another year where um, we recreated the Ad Academy of Athens. Um, Dave and Sh um, Shervin, who missed it, became bust. Shervin became a decapitated head. Uh, we, um, we really have a good time with these. And you can see that my lab is really committed to excellence in everything that it does. Um, uh, this, is, this year we did. Um, I, was, I happened to be at a fundraiser with Chris Martin and uh, Seth Meyer, and I got them to uh, hold my lab's t-shirt. And I was like, how do we get them as a cameo and a card? And from that, I decided that we would do a Saturday Night Live where Seth Meyer was doing weekend news, and Chris Martin would be a, um, uh, a guest uh, musician. And so we actually recreated all of the classic. You may not know these, but these are basically uh, Wayne's World. And this is actually the image from Chris Martin performing, uh, Coldplay performing on Saturday Night Live. Um, and on and on. Cone, I was a conehead. Um, then uh, I had actually had a major accident and uh, uh, was stranded on the West Coast for four months. And when I returned, the day I returned, my lab was shooting this. And they surprised me by um, kind of uh, sort of uh, making this card of the re uh, return of Sabeti. Um, uh, and then family holiday cards. You can see these are sort of yeah, family photos from different times. Uh, last year for the um, uh, Olympics, uh, and this year uh, we recreated. Uh, uh, it's for the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, so we always pick some some topic, um, and then we recreated all sorts of uh, movie scenes. That's my son playing ET in that photo. Um, anyway, so that is uh, that is my lab, and I like I always like to show this because it just gives you a, a sense. It, everyone in, like the work I'm showing is is done by these individuals over many many years doing this work, and you can see that year after year they bring their creativity, their uh, you know, OCD, their love of science to everything that they do. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Questions? Let me put my, actually, I'm put my phone on airport. I just realized it is. Um, the video? 
Um, okay. Yeah, we've got some time, so I'll show you the video. I actually might just go on YouTube because I, um, I'll just show you the end of it. You don't need to see the whole video. Um, oh yeah, so. Um, let me see if I can get sound here. Here we go. Do we, actually, do we have an audio person? I don't Just. What's that? It's coming through the HDMI. Yeah, so we don't have to do this. Oh, it's coming through the HDMI. Yeah. But did it actually come through? Um, yeah, so why don't you go ahead and play it? Okay. And you can try to turn it up on the board. And... Oh, this is coming, it's, okay. That's what I'm saying, it's. Sorry about that, I didn't see this. Okay, uh, why don't I take questions and then maybe we'll, we'll see if we, yeah, go ahead. So how big a part does the uh, poor economy and infrastructure play in outbreaks such as Ebola? Yeah. And how would they look in the developed Western world? Okay, so do, if you heard the question, sort of how did the poor infrastructure, um, you know, in the kind of, uh, lack of uh, uh, a lot of resources and health resources in those countries affect Ebola and how does it, would it play out here? Well, I mean, ultimately uh, it is true that um, we were able to control it here in the United States, but not really that well. I mean, ultimately when the, um, when the outbreak started in the United States, there was only one lab in the country that could test for Ebola and that was the CDC. And so, you know, one of the issues was that they weren't really established in Texas to do that testing. It took them a while to get their acts together. Um, and that was with all of this advance notice of knowing that there was an outbreak that was escalating for some time before. Um, and so uh, we were very, very fortunate that we only had one case at a time coming in, that it hadn't hit a big city, but we were not, we were not prepared either we were, um, to deal with something of a large scale. Uh, and that's what we saw during um, the 1918 Spanish flu, we're not that much further along. And so there's a lot that we need to do to go from here to there. We have the, in, we essentially have the resources. One of the other things is the patients that came to the United States were able to be treated in these hospital facilities with lots and lots of resources. We don't have that many of those either. So if we were overrun, if we suddenly had tons of cases, we wouldn't be that well positioned either at this point. Did you want to play it or is it, are you still working on it? Okay. Actually, if I'm going to show this video, I will kind of set it up first. So um, it was the summer of 2014. Uh, we were going into the summer. We had 21 people that were kind of come stay with us and uh, learn how to do the fundamentals of molecular biology and uh, be able to do testing across the country. Um, and just as uh, we were like heading into the summer, uh, the Ebola outbreak hit in Sierra Leone. And none of our Sierra Leone partners were able to come. Only our partners from, at that time, Nigeria and Senegal, uh, were sort of slated to come. We created this whole program, um, and here they were. And I had actually, since I, since Philomena and I, the, the woman who was uh, singing the other shot, and I had worked together for so long, uh, we had established a, a, a tradition, and she'd come to the United States many times, that we would basically sing together uh, over the summer and then go in at the end of the summer and record the music that we created. And so we'd already set that up. I'd already written the instrumental uh, and recorded the instrumentals for all of these songs. And I was ready to like work on lyrics with her and, and go in and record. So we'd had that all set up. And then suddenly May, you know, late May of 2014, Ebola outbreak hits. None of our collaborators in Sierra Leone can come. These guys are all here. Uh, but meanwhile, I can't really interact with them because we're spending the whole time dealing with uh, what was going on in West Africa. Um, but the one thing that uh, we said that no matter what we were going to do, was just always get together on Sundays and sing. We just decided that that was one thing that they have the tradition, no matter how bananas it is at the hospitals they work at, that they come in every morning and they sing. We weren't quite ready to commit to that, but we said 
every Sunday, no matter what, I'll come. We'll work, you know, we'll write music together. We'll just play together. And so I gathered with these six women who were, um, who were there in the, in the program, and that's what we did every Sunday. And a lot of the other folks in the program would come and listen. Um, and it was always really hard to justify, but it did feed our soul, and we kept doing it. And then one uh, you know, week within that summer in July, and later in July, essentially within that same week, we find out that two of the nurses in our ward uh, in Kenema are infected with Ebola and then pass away quite soon after. Then Dr. Khan becomes ill with Ebola. Um, uh, then he passes away from Ebola. And then at the end that week, Christian calls me and tells me that um, you know, he's identified Ebola now in Lagos, Nigeria, a city of 20 million. And so here we are in the middle of complete tragedy, um, on the precipice of a cataclysm. And somehow, we just decided we'll still get together on Sunday. Um, and it was one of those moments. At that point, actually, when that first Sunday that we got together, it was um, Dr. Khan had become ill. He hadn't yet passed away. And I was, we were just despondent. And so I started playing this one recording a set of music. And uh, we, well, we started playing lots of different music, and everybody was just like, like it, it was flat, of course. Nobody wanted to sing anything. And then I pulled out this track um, that was like an old track my band had always had, and we didn't know what to do with it. And we started playing it, and I had this one um, uh, like refrain that's all I'd come up with for the song. It was just, uh, 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 yeah, 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 uh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I told the women to sing that. And they started singing it, and for some reason, that hit the spot. They just lit up, and they kept saying, uh-uh, yeah, yeah. And I saw uh, Nikkei here, like a smile just kind of enter her face and this feeling of elation. Um, and, and suddenly, like um, in that moment, these lyrics came to me. And it sort of, it said, I've, you know, I've spent a lifetime for one truth. And I was sort of speaking to Dr. Khan across the, you know, across the, the ocean and saying, a lifetime for one truth, that I'm alive, and so are you. And we are here, and we are the proof. Um, and, I, you know, and I began to sort of say, you know, a lifetime, we write, we laugh, we cry, we dream, we scream, we have a hunger that will never die, and I'm in this fight with you always. And those are the sort of lines that came up. And so this song burst out of me in one of the you know, darkest moments in my life. And there's something about that, about you know, that, that when we sort of have this conversation after this, I want to let you know is that no matter what you do, I know, I have no question in my mind that you guys are ambitious, you're focused, and you're hardworking. But, the difference between you know, whether or not you will be successful and be able to maintain yourself is how you keep your humanity. How do you keep yourself in those dark times so that it doesn't get so dark that you drop out? Um, because life has so many of these challenges uh, ahead of you. And so that, this was just a reminder that this thing that we I thought was frivolous, that I didn't know I was doing it, was like critical. And this video, so we ended up recording the song. I mean, just in the middle of all those bananas, it was just like, it was almost like we just kept, were compelled. Like we just went in and we recorded the song and then suddenly, again, I'm, I'm dealing with 100 different things. And the night before they left, I just suddenly said, hey, let's just make a video. Like, you're about to go on the front lines in the middle of the Ebola outbreak. It was still right in the peak time. And I said, let's just go and like, just show our joy. And so this is video and is all done literally the night before they went to go on the front lines of the Ebola outbreak. And so here's just the, the kind of the ending where some of those lyrics I just described play. Um, now, a little context.
All right, sorry. Other questions? Um, so to use social media in other contexts or to use yeah um, absolutely I mean I think that um, I mean we're we're in an age in general where uh, social media connectivity um, the sort of massive amount of information and, and the new types of algorithms that we can develop to mine that uh, data are making lots of things very, very powerful. There are, I, I have a different uh, interest area in cognitive science and I have a very specific, um, I, I wanna, a side project of mine if anybody's interested is to try to uncover the biological basis of the idea of Young's archetype. Um, and I think I know something about it. Um, but it's something where only in the information age where you have that much data can you start to understand it. And what if you know, we were able to, to better understand ourselves and how our own minds work in a totally different fundamental way. So I think all of these different fields are being transformed and made possible. I mean, you're coming up of age in a time where there are boundless amounts of massive world-changing discoveries that can be made uh, just because we have enough information to, to see those phenomena uh, in, in a real way. Yeah. No, you and then you, yeah. Okay, so all these techniques are, um, they're here to try and help us react to large outbreaks. But what exactly is large? Uh, they're, so actually, they're, they're in fact designed, the, the tools that I'm sort of talking about are designed to detect any outbreak. In fact, you know, fundamentally, I wrote, I wrote an article at the very beginning of the outbreak that talked about the fact that, um, you know, when that first case happened, it should have been, uh, a shock and awe type of a situation. It should have been 50 people that were on the ground to deal with the one case because the, the problem with outbreaks is, uh, and viruses is that they spread in this very you know, massively um, you know, rapid way where it's uh, one can lead to two, to lead to four. You know, depending on that R naught, it can go in any which, the trajectory can be ma massive um, and, and you lose control pretty quickly. And so ultimately it's actually, the, the system is designed to deal with very, very small outbreaks, an outbreak of one. Um, and that's essentially, you want, to, you don't ever know where the match will light. You just need to be able to put out every single fire anywhere. Um, but the kind of outbreak that it's trying to avoid are the ones that become, start moving regionally and globally uh, and can get into the millions and hundreds of millions if you don't, if you lose control. Yeah. Um, are you concerned about the recent outbreaks, not on the same scale, of course, maybe in the US with things like measles because of not being vaccinated? Um, of course, yeah. I mean, I think that um, I have you know, a young son, so of course I think about um, uh, these uh, a lot, and, and personally, but, but even before that, just uh, you know, for, for humanity. Um, it's complicated when it comes to vaccines. Now, I, I'm pro-vaccination. My, my son is up to date. I'm not. Um, but I also think that we, as a scientific community, have to do a much better job of engaging people and not treating anti-vaxxers like crazy people, but just like concerned parents, which is what they are, and maybe misguided concerned parents. But um, fundamentally, I, you know, I, I think there's a reason why people feel the way they do. And, and ultimately, science has not been that forthcoming, has not been that transparent, has not earned the trust of the public. And so there's a lot more that we need to do as a community to you know, get ourselves to the point where we can engage on those topics. There. Do I, do I think what? Sorry. Um, it's, I, I don't have a form. I don't, not that I don't have a formed opinion. I don't have a final opinion on that. I, I am uh, conflicted on that to some degree. Um, I think a fine way of doing it is saying you can't go to public schools. or um, that, you know, that, that is the kind of place where you can say, hey, if you want to homeschool your child, if you want to take that risk, but you cannot pose a risk to other children and you cannot. So I, I think that you don't have to do anything that you don't want to do per se, but you can't put other people at risk at the same time. And there are a lot of, I mean, the tragedy of the anti-vaxxer uh, you know, movement is that their children are likely not the ones that are impacted. It's, it's other children who are, uh, you know, who are immunocompromised, 
who have other reasons why they can't be vaccinated, that they are putting at risk. And if herd immunity goes down, those individuals will not even have a choice in the matter. Um, and so I, I do put the them first. And so I, I think that no child should have to go to school with somebody who could put them, no parent should you know, have to send their child to school with somebody who'd put uh, their children at risk. And so I think if choice matters, then everyone should have the choice. Um, and maybe they could create a charter school that's only anti-vaccinated you know, vaccinated children. And that's, they could, they could think of other solutions, but I think that there's gotta be choice on all sides if you're gonna say choice. Yeah, was there a question? Yeah. I think that just came up with my, that's my stance, I guess. I didn't have one, but now I do, yeah. How do you think it's very bold for you to be in a big town of primates, like you said, so how do you treat um, influenza or uh, the outbreaks differently if it's like, for example, a bat population? Like, you, you can't quarantine animals, right? Like, so yeah, no, uh, uh, so how do you treat an outbreak differently if it's going through, like if it's an outbreak of bats or if it's an outbreak that's starting in bats or? Of, like do outbreaks can outbreaks be an outbreak in the bat population and also the population or they Yeah, I mean yeah and and uh, I mean ultimately you try to stop it wherever you can and um, it's an issue like for example Lassa fever is a, a virus that um, can sometimes infect humans and can cause human outbreaks, but it's actually pretty prevalent in the mouse population. And so you know in, in some regions of Sierra Leone, forty percent of the mice have Lassa. And every once in a while, a particular strain will jump into the human population and might then cause trouble in the human population. Um, and so that's a, that's a huge issue because you can't vaccinate all mice into perpetuity. You can't even track them. And so uh, where you can, where there's a place that you can stop transmission or, or support, the bat, you know, support the mouse population or something, you, you might do it. But ultimately, you just have to stop it from coming into humans. The reason why smallpox was the first you know, major globally successful vaccination campaign is because it's a virus that doesn't mutate very quickly. And so that's one huge component. So it doesn't change and the vaccines can be very effective, but also that it's a, it's a virus that is really only seen in the human population. So it's much easier to eradicate a virus that's human specific than it is to eradicate something that infects other animals. Yeah. That, like, I mean, how does the whole, like, misinformation thing work in, like, other countries during, like, outbreaks and stuff like that? And do you, like, find, like, that a certain, like, area or type of people, like, are more trusting of medical staff versus others? Um, I, I mean, misinformation and sort of the idea of fake news, there's an article that was recently written about it in the New York Times, but is a problem, like, in general and in, in every setting. Um, but in an outbreak, it's like, you know, you, and so I wrote a book recently called Outbreak Culture with a journalist named Laura Salahi, and we did it by kind of doing a survey of people working in the Ebola outbreak and trying to get them to give us the dirt anonymously of like things that they saw. And, and you know, and it was just because it was to kind of confirm, but we tried to do it in a very unbiased way, but, uh, but because we had a hypothesis that, that, that basically the culture was toxic and people are crazy and you see things that are just, like unconscionable that happened during outbreaks. And so we, we basically, at the end of the book, describe this thing that we call outbreak culture that we say stems from a crucible. So outbreaks are a crucible. You know, you take all of the problems that humans have interacting with each other, you know, bullying and, you know, Twitter rages and, and you know, lying and corruption and all the kind of nonsense that humans are doing all the time, and then throw on top of that an insidious, invisible, deadly threat that weaponizes one person against another. And you can just see how that escalates, right, out of control. So people think, oh, we're gonna see the best of humanity. We do, we see some of the best of humanity during outbreaks, but we see a lot of the worst of humanity. I've seen things that I can't unsee um, that are really disturbing. Um, and so ultimately, across the country, across the globe, uh, there's fake news, there's, uh, you know, uh, intentionally malicious things that are happening, perverse incentives that are taking hold, people who are profiteers. Um, and so fundamentally, uh, you know, we can't tackle that in every walk of life, but we have to tackle that in an outbreak situation. It's like there's a point where you have to say, everybody, how do we get people to um, rise to the occasion, to recognize that, you know, uh, they have to act in the right way because the virus thrives while we fight amongst ourselves. Um, and, uh, and we really saw that. I, I, I certainly know that a number of individuals and organizations 
uh, were directly responsible for people dying by their actions uh, because they put themselves and their profit first. Um, and so all of that needs to be addressed. And then you said, you know, are there certain people or certain places? I mean, I have found when I've worked on loss of fever for decades in the, you know, for a decade in, in the countries I work in, I have great relationships with the communities I work in because you're there for a long time, you engage with them, you listen to them, you're partners with them. Uh, it's when you're not um, that they don't respond. It's pretty simple, you know, that, that's a whole thing where they're like, oh, they don't want us there. Yeah, because you just came in, you bullied in, you knocked everybody over. Um, I mean, the, my book is based on the fact that uh, groups came in and tried to completely oust and, and, and badmouth the, the people at Kenema to, in order to take over their control of their hospital. I mean, that's the kind of nonsense that happens during outbreaks. Yeah. So how do you deal mentally with all the ugliness and death you see in your day-to-day -day job? Because it seems like it might be quite overwhelming for you to see in this amount of um, um, bad things happen every single day. Yeah, well, I mean, if it was happening, like, I don't do well working with people who are not good people. Um, and so I, you know, I've worked in toxic environments before, and I, I'll keep my head down and I'll, I'll get through it, but it's, I know it definitely takes a toll on me. Um, and so I, outside threats I can deal with, inside threats I don't. And so one for my, myself, you'll see my lab is like adorable and goofy, um, but you know, they're also the, the best at what they do. I mean, most people would say that I just recruit the absolute best people, uh, but it's because I have the luxury. I mean, I have only, four, you know, I have 40, that's a big lab, but it's still only 40 people in the entire universe. And so I make a choice to pick people with really good intentions, and I don't care how smart you are, how good you are, there's always somebody else who can do it as well as you can and also make me laugh, uh, you know, and also be nice to the people around you. And so uh, the way that I am able to sustain it is by having my immediate environment be really good, and the outside threats we kind of deal with as a collective. We laugh through insanity. Um, and, uh, and so I don't, I don't think, I, I almost, funny thing is I, you know, I had been offered a position or on the transition team and then possibly a position in Hillary Clinton's uh, administration. I was very excited about it and uh, it's getting recorded. Oh, is this being, yeah. Oh, well, anyway, uh, and I was very, <laughs> I was very excited about it. And then, you know, later I had the opportunity, I was contacted to maybe join the Trump administration and I was like, I, I should do this. I mean, I, I'm supposed to do this. And then ultimately, I made the decision and, and seeing the way that it's been a revolving door, I made the right decision to say, I wouldn't do my best work in an environment if I was feeling as if it was you know, not supported. And so I, I, I could, you know, the fact of the matter is like, we also, everyone needs to know you have a threshold, right? So I deal with a lot of devastating things, but devastating things are happening around the world. I'm not gonna turn my eye away, around, away from it and do, you know, science that doesn't you know, have issues that come with it. So I'll go there, but I'll go there by protecting myself and creating an environment which I can do in the best way possible um, by singing with the people I work with. But all of those things are just, that's how you do it. Yeah. So yeah, okay. We'll cut out that last question. My, all my funding gets cut. Okay, here we go, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I work mostly in viruses because just you have to, even even that is not specializing. There's hun hundreds of human-associated pathogen viruses and you know th thousands and millions of viruses. But um, but I, uh, there is uh, Deb Hung here at the Broad Institute. And a number of other people are working on um, the same kinds of systems to affect bacteria. So the neat thing is that we can take we can co-opt anything we find in nature and figure out ways of targeting other things. And so there's yeah, there's a very rich uh, exciting community of people trying to develop these types of technologies for bacteria and parasites and all sorts of things. Um, but uh, yeah, you don't do everything. So I can just engage. Uh huh. Go ahead. Um, all right, like, are there any like, um, like parts of this that are like about like um, educating people like, in those regions or is it more, more about like just connecting existing professionals um, into a network to make yeah, sorry, just repeat the question. Oh, I think my brain rebooted, to be honest. Okay. Actually, I just started thinking, can we cut that question out? I may ask you about that later. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, is it mostly about like um, taking existing healthcare professionals and like like connecting with them 
in like other regions where outbreaks happen, or is it like part of it about like educating new people, or is it both? The, like essentially, what we're trying to do about that. Um, I mean, I don't know what our mandate is. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. I think what we're trying to do is just create tools that'll that can be used and can be scaled. Um, and so, you know, our best way of doing it is saying, okay, we have a problem here in West Africa where we work. Let's build that out. Let's let's empower. You know, frontline workers obviously are really important to kind of engage. They're already there. They're already acting in the front lines. So how do we just get them to know a little bit more information that could make them be more effective and more protected and all of that and above? But then, of course, like where we can, sure. We so um, Todd Brown, the, the teacher I was talking about, is right now at the CDC. He's now a fellow in the CDC, and he's engaging with them about how to take our simulation and make it a you know a broad use so that every one of your high schools would do it. Like everyone should get to experience an outbreak um, happening around them with lo low consequences. I, it's, it's a great exercise. It's a great teaching exercise. So we're, we're invested in all of those pieces. But for us right now, you know, our main mission is uh, frontline workers in the specific regions that we work in. And, and in just trying to do that with excellence, you'll learn a lot that might be helpful to a lot more people. Yeah? When, when you deal with an outbreak, such as Ebola, where you're lacking uh, treatment, what can doctors do on the field to help those infected? Um, I mean, ultimately, I, so I often talk about um, <clears throat> uh, a paper by Ruslan Metsatov. Um, and Ruslan is a phenomenal scientist who's done a lot of really interesting molecular biology work. But one of my favorite papers is a paper he published in Cell that essentially uh, kind of explains why uh, the adage exists, you know, feed a fever, starve a cold. Um, that ultimately, you know, if you have mice that are infected with bacteria uh, versus mice infected with viruses and you treat them by either giving them sugar, like a high sugar diet, uh, or one where they fast, or one where they eat a normal diet, um, the, the mice infected with bacteria with a high sugar diet will die, with a medium diet will suffer but live, and with a fasting diet will survive. And mice infected by viruses, um, you know, uh, will do better when fed and will likely die when fasted. Um, and so that's actually a really huge difference in how uh, you should treat a virus and a bacteria. So it is really disturbing that when you go into your doctor, they're like, mm, could be, who knows, right? Like, that's why you actually want to know what you have, because different pathogens have very different biology and different effects. So there's a lot you can do by just understanding. Um, but fundamentally, even if you don't know what you have, and in most cases you don't, just be healthy. That is the number one thing. So start off, your insurance policy to yourself is sleep, eat, and rest. You guys are all in this race, but the fact of the matter is, yeah, I know, you're gonna have to do it. It's, and it takes discipline. It is this kind of thing where it's like, oh man, I haven't slept. I, I know what it's like. My freshman year at MIT, I was proud that the first night I pulled three all-nighters. I. It was stupid. I look back at my, and I did very, like, I really struggled my freshman year, and I looked back, and I was like, I was, a, I mean, I, I was a moron. Like, I, my answers made no sense. It was crazy. Um, because, and of course, they didn't make sense. I hadn't slept. I hadn't ate. I hadn't done anything. And so, ultimately, um, you do all of that, like, you know, um, that's bravado. If you really want to do it right, you get discipline and you do something in a way that's healthy. I always, and it, actually my freshman year at MIT is the only year I didn't exercise, I didn't do a sport because I thought I was going to drop it because I had to focus on work. And the next year I joined the tennis team and ever since then I got straight A's and it was fine. Um, luckily, I was very lucky that my freshman year was past no record. Um, so that also, uh, yeah, was great and also made me like discombobulated because I didn't know what to do without metrics. But um, but, uh, but ultimately, like, I think the fundamental thing was I was exercising. And exercising just forced me to have some sort of a health routine of some sort. Um, and so ultimately, uh, in every aspect of your life, including fighting infectious diseases, it's around keeping healthy. So if you don't have drugs and treatments, you just make sure they have fluids. You make sure that they have to sleep. You know, ultimately, it's been shown that like, the, the, one of the things that kills people with Ebola is the fact that they're trapped in a dark room with nobody to see them. That's what kills people. I mean, you know, there's a lot of studies to the fact that uh, your environment and your feelings about things is what causes you to be able to fight diseases. So there's tons you can do even without. I'm actually, I'm, I'm very anti-drugs. I rarely take drugs. Uh, 
for anything. I, I shattered my pelvis in both my knees. I'm half metal. I have 36 steel plates in my body. And I didn't take any drugs. I just, I took it for a hot minute. And then, you know, obviously anesthesia during 30 hours of surgery, sure. Um, but then I was like, I'm done. So I'm, I'm not, a, I, I, I love medicine, but I, I avoid it whenever I can and try to find things that are most natural when possible. I said none of the above. <laughs> I think none of the above. I, I think, I mean, I think governments could be. Um, I think that the military could and should be, only because you have a huge workforce that is coordinated, organized, and orchestrated, and ready to go. And if we, we actually spent less time teaching them how to, you know, kill people and more time teaching them how to, like, um, do clinical care, we'd be, they'd have uh, a lot of skills that would, help them once they le left the military, and it would prepare them for what is likely the, you know, in every major war in history, the number one cause of death was pathogens anyway, and, uh, and in the wars of the future will likely be, uh, there will likely be biological warfare. And so I think that if we actually had a military that was prepared, that would probably be the best case scenario, because they can, they can move in at the level. They would just have to have, uh, and they do, right, a lot of, uh, the military's role, um, when done right, is around uh, development, sort of State Department work. And so it really is around building communities, working with the communities they work with. Yeah, I think it, in, in, but more broadly about that, it's just, it's not like NGOs or governments, it's, it's, uh, it's specific actors that are that have the right mindset. It's, it's not an easy thing to deal with an outbreak either. Um, ultimately, um, and it, it's not something a lot of people have thought about. And so um, it's a great challenge. And um, a lot of those organizations are just not created. So for one example, like uh, a lot of the NGOs just couldn't have anything more at very greatest as a six month, six week deployment. Problem with six week deployment is you get there, you figure out the lay of the land. Most of the people showed up and like asked a lot of questions and then started bossing people around and then left. I mean, it was just, it was a cast of characters moving in. They, they're just not, they're not built to stay for months and months at a time in these places. You need the military that can stay for six months to a year. They can learn the situation and, and have these long deployments. So um, what was amazing about the Ebola outbreak and all these other outbreaks is how people collectively all just dove in and started helping. And that's beautiful and that, you know, there's a lot of really positive things there. But it did also create a lot of chaos when people weren't. You know, positioned and ready, and a lot of people just don't have that right, that very, not right, but that very specific mindset of how to deal with this kind of risk. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, it, this sort of is a predicting before they're going to happen because we're actually just picking up any infection that's going on. And um, ultimately, I always talk about when people think, of, oh, like, where's the next virus coming from? Like, HIV didn't come out of nowhere. It was, it was circulating in clinics for a long time before it became HIV. Um, and so you are predicting when you just are better at diagnosing the run-of-the-mill infections. Because if you are, like, when people ask me to predict what the next big virus is, I always say it's, it's going to be one of the normal cast of characters. It's influenza. It's Lassa. It's something that has already, like, nine steps along the way of being, you know, good at what it does that will then click. You know, they'll have one mutation that suddenly makes it more um, pathogenic or more transmissible or whatever. Like, just the, it's the one step away that I'm worried about. And so as we just start picking up the, all the things that are circulating, we'll pick up what is closest to, you know, that tipping point. Um, and then there's other things you can use to predict, uh, like, you know, for example, after the Haiti earthquake, very common for uh, outbreaks to start when there's been a disruption of infrastructure. So you don't you don't you don't need even sophisticated prediction to know that that's the case. And so, uh, but you could get better at even that part. Um, yeah. Yeah. How does um, global cooperation work on like for, for these incidents, and how does like politics influence like the like just like getting down the dirty and like actually helping? Um, politics, I mean, are, are a major player. Ultimately, I would say that the, 
that ultimately the, the technology is there. The technology is already existing that could help us, you know, um, stop outbreaks from happening. We still need to get them to be in, to implementation and getting them where they need to be. Um, but the thing that I would say, the number one thing that I think will define whether or not we can can succeed is whether or not we can work together. And ultimately, you know, if you actually have groups like Boko Haram working in Nigeria, targeting you know, Redeemer's Church, and you have an outbreak on top of that, um, it, those, are the kind, it, it, I mean, those are the things you won't be able to deal with. Or just, again, like I said, the run-of-the-mill politics, the Game of Thrones-iness of the world today um, will just uh, can, can disrupt that. And so I think that our ability to respond to um, outbreaks will have a lot to do with our ability to man. There's, so there's, there's like a hundred different ways that political circumstances will affect how we respond to outbreaks. The fact that countries like China during SARS or Sierra Leone at the beginning of the Ebola outbreak tried to suppress information about the viruses circulating because it was going to affect their economy. Uh, you know, and only did they ever uh, finally you know, capitulate and say that there's something going on when it was, was out of control, out of their hands. And so the, that, those are simple things. And, and again, there's real reasons that they were afraid their economies would be um, disrupted, and they were, but not nearly as much as they were when they let it you know, get to an escalation point. So it's around how do you, the solutions are going to be not to everybody has to be a good actor and everybody has to do right. The solution is convincing people that doing the right thing is actually the best approach you know, if, if from an economic standpoint, from a reputation standpoint, from every aspect. And maybe just one or two more questions. Here we go. A question more because you said that you were slightly adverse to medicine or for a like, natural. Mm -hmm. um, that's personal, by the way. That's not. That's that's a personal decision. I'm, I'm not trying to tell anybody. Everyone should take the medicine they feel they need. Yeah. Um, so one common uh, thing people get sick, especially with like cold, is to drink tea. But honey has sugar in it. Mm -hmm. And you said mm -hmm. start with cool. So how oh, do I, you I forgot to do the answer, yeah. Balance, how do you suggest balancing out when you have a cold? The amount of tea with honey. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it would be helpful. So, you know, the funny thing is, if, even if you have a viral infection, um, uh, honey is and honey is generally like a, de a very, it's a raw honey in particular is a good form of sugar, and so there's other reasons why it's, you know, it's, it's an, a good choice. And and part of the the honey is, I think, it's symptomatic relief as well. It sort of coats the throat and makes you feel better, and that's important. Um, but generally, I um, I eat a lot of so my number one tip to anybody who's afraid of getting uh, sick is uh, whatever you have, have avocado. Um, and that's because, again, Ruslan, this amazing human, uh, discovered that um, there's a chemical uh, that is in avocado. And I think avocado is the only uh, you know, food that he said that, he's, you know, that it's in, that it's kind of ubiquitously in. Uh, but it has a chemical that competitively inhibits bacterial uptake of sugar. So I will always, when I have an infection, whether it is viral or bacterial, will have avocado. Because the one thing is, you know, people didn't die of influenza in the Spanish flu. Most of them died of bacterial pneumonia. So when you have a viral infection, it disrupts your epithelial cells. And on those epithelial cells will become this opportunistic environment for bacteria to grow. And so most people get it. You, if you ever remember, you get this like infection that's really bad, and then suddenly you have this cough that never goes away. Or then you have this cough that suddenly goes into your lungs, and then you, before you know it, you're in this really bad situation. That's because most people are having a viral infection that then gets a super infection of bacteria on top of it. So no matter what you have, you need to be worried about the bacteria that are going to have a field day with your illness. And so I always say have avocado at that point, um, because it will, you know, you, you want to have a lot of ginger, you know, uh, I, you know, do like the, the things that are kind of antibacterial is a good, good idea no matter what in that environment. But then also then feeding yourself with probiotics that are healthy bacteria too. And I, if you do all that, you can have a little honey as well. It's a, it's a, it's a, all right. Yeah. Think of the healthcare system in countries like the U.S. as sort of a threat creating or threat that creates conditions that you could have that. The current state of the healthcare system in countries like the U.S. The U.S. Um, I mean, yes. There's no country that's prepared for um, 
for an outbreak because there's no country that really is tracking what's circulating in the right way. And the um, uh, US is sort of yeah, lower in that capacity. I think countries in Europe are, have a little bit better because they have the national healthcare system. They have a lot of other ways that they're more coordinated than we are. Um, but, but yeah, I think all, all countries. Uh, you improve your healthcare system, you kind of create an insurance policy against um, outbreaks happening. Two questions here. You guys just tell me that when you guys can cut me off whenever you. Yeah. Uh, uh, how do you suggest, like, uh, like you were mentioning, like how like how, like this outbreak medicine could be like almost like autonomized? So like, how do you think that like you could use incentives to make countries like not want to suppress stuff and like groups want to be more active in helping it? Um, I mean, I think so. How do you get countries to want to like? report. I mean, I think ultimately you, you have to convey to them the real risk of it happening, but then also show them the ways that you can stop it. That if you have it, 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 it is a position of strength to say, hey, we caught Ebola in our country. Uh, it's, it's a little bit about the narrative that you create, right? Um, and so if you kind of are feeling as if you were trapped, but if you're like, Ebola can be anywhere. We caught it. We caught it early. This is a system that we put in place to make sure it didn't happen. And so we, we spent a lot of time early on you know, going to the Ministry of Health, trying to show them how they, have a, they do have a lot of vulnerabilities, just where they work, what's going on, but at the same time, you can come in and be the country that, so, you know, for example, when I had to spend time talking to people at Harvard about the fact that I wanted Harvard to be announced as, you know, institution A in my paper on mumps. And, you know, when I talked to the, the um, PR office about this, because I had to go to every office, because it's, it's actually valuable, I, I was saying the story is not mumps at Harvard. It's mumps detection at Harvard, right? There's, there's pro there was likely as much mumps at Harvard than in any other school. We were the only ones detecting it. And so that's the story you want to tell. And it's not Ebola in Sierra Leone. It's Ebola detection in Sierra Leone. And so I think that's what you try to convince people. Yeah. Vector-borne versus human transmission? Or do you see one in the future? A transition from a like do you, would you say like diseases are more and more vector born or more and more human? Yeah, I mean I I don't know if it's going in any one direction. So the question is are there are diseases moving towards being more likely to be vector born or more likely to be human to human? I think there's ebbs and flows. I mean there's a concern obviously with climate change that there will be more mosquitoes or more ticks and more other things, and so you will have more of these vector born diseases being a problem. Um, but uh, there's nothing sort of specific that I'm thinking about about the biology changing, per se. But they can always switch. I mean, Zika is a mosquito-borne disease, but it can be transmitted from human to human. Um, the, uh, there are many ways that these things can happen, and it, they're very um, opportunistic diseases. If there's a good opportunity to move from human to human, like the way that Ebola did, it will. Um, otherwise, it'll you know, use another path. So, because you're saying that these diseases are changing, and how do they? Well, that's uh, so. And how do we detect them? And those changes, and that is one of the benefits of using a nucleic acid-based detection or treatment, is that you can change it very quickly. So, during the Zika uh, epidemic, we were developing um, this platform for CAS. Uh, um, Based you know, di diagnostics of uh, Zika, and uh, you know during that time, as we were just getting the paper out, um, a paper was published that showed that there's a specific mutation that causes microcephaly, uh, and in with, within four days, you know we had a kind of move out, and I think at day six we had a working diagnostic, right? So ultimately, they're going to move, they're going to change. That's the whole point. They're changing all the time, and so we want to be able to be tracking it and and moving it. So we can sequence to find out what's circulating, and then we can develop the rapid readouts, both the diagnostics as well as the antivirals, to, to always be tracking and treating and detecting what's circulating. All right. Oh, yeah, OK. Two more questions, maybe? Is that any less pressing thoughts? OK, these two questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Are you going to close it out? OK. So do you, like, you mentioned how like, the idea of CRISPR and Cas9 is motivated by how bacteria and cells react to viruses. Do, like, how, do, how do humans do, do they interact with bacteria? Do they have similar systems or how do they 
Yeah, so, so you know, eukaryotes, I mean, eukaryotes have our adaptive immune system. Um, and that's sort of how we respond. And so there is all the monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies, these, or these, you know, massively multiplex antibody tools are, are pretty powerful as well and potent as well. And they're essentially trying to, so, you know, uh, Jim Crow, James Crow at the University uh, 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 Van, uh, so, um, Vanderbilt uh, uh, Medical School. Um, he does amazing work um, where he's, uh, and a number of other individuals work in this space where they'll take people who've recovered from Ebola, they'll sequence out they'll, their immune system, and they'll get a readout of all of the different epitopes that they you know, can go after, and then they'll find the ones that will target Ebola, and then they will create um, synthetic versions of those to create as a drug. So that's a really, really powerful uh, way, and, and the benefit of that is you're now recapitulating something that humans already do, and so that can work even better than what we were developing. Um, it still takes some time to develop. It's, there's still some other caveats to it. And so uh, for us, if we can actually, um, if, for us, if we can, uh, the challenge is getting it to work in mammalian cells. But if you do, it, it, you know, it's instantly going to cut down the virus. And so uh, we're, there's a, there are multiple tracks you can go to. But essentially, I mean, that, that's the kind of thing you actually want to look at everybody's immune system and how they respond and then figure out which one you can co-opt the best and, and work in that way. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say on behalf of everyone here, thank you so much for taking the time. And, uh, <laughs> would you mind uh, taking a group picture with all of us as well? Oh, yeah, sure. That's it. Yeah,